Cup victory, another showing of Summer of 66, featuring hat-trick hero Jeff Hurst. Positive goal. 25 years on, nobody can prove it. But from the heart of the Soviet Union, the man whose opinion counted at 5 o'clock on July the 30th, 1966, gives us his view now. What is certain is that his response provided this Englishman with the platform to achieve an unparalleled place in the history of the game. The only player ever to score a hat-trick in a World Cup final is still marketing that achievement. Commercially, I think, strangely enough, as it's gone on, I've become more and more successful commercially. People want to, me to do things. Which, funnily enough, didn't really happen directly after the World Cup. It, it's very, it surprises me, and I spoke to my wife about it. I sort of do better today, 20 years later. Whether it's the memory that's got stronger and we haven't really achieved anything at that level over this period of time, I don't really know. It's hard to put your finger on. But it certainly changed all our lives, um, the whole family, um, because it affects the children. Um, my children and others, you know, that's Jeff Hurst's daughter, etc. Uh, they've got to live with that. But um, I'm very lucky. I've got a wife that, uh, as I said earlier, is down to earth and keeps her feet on the ground and certainly keeps my feet on the ground. And it's not been very hard to live with, I think. I'm just an ordinary guy that's that, uh, just good at something a long time ago. A long time ago, Ron Greenwood converted Hurst from an unexceptional wing half into an exceptional goal scorer. When you, you, you're a midfield player, it takes a long time to uh, progress to learning the, the trade as a forward player. Um, it seemed to work out fairly well, but I want, when I say instant success, I don't suppose I was a success overnight. It took me a long time to learn to score goals and be in position, position to score goals. Um, but I was very, very fortunate having someone like Ron that uh, was a great teacher. And uh, everything, I suppose, my whole life has tra transferred because of success, and I owe a lot to him. People sometimes say that goal scoring is a natural thing that can't be taught, but you use the word learn there, so presumably... Well, I've, yes, I've proved that to the contrary. Um, I, I did learn to score goals and how and where and to strike balls from different angles. I mean, I was a natural a goal scorer. I was a natural front player. I had a fair basic amount of talent, but um, when you can sit, compare me with people like Jimmy Greaves, I mean, he has more talent in his little finger than I've got in the rest of my body. He's a, I'm an absolutely unbelievable goal scorer. I had to learn that, but I'm a good learner. I joined the squad, in fact, in December of 65, I think, and Alf's policy was to introduce a, per, a player but not actually play him in the first game, generally, it appeared to me. I played my first game against West Germany, funnily enough, um, in 66, uh, in the February. Nobby Stiles scored that day in the one 0 defeat of West Germany uh, with a number nine in his back, so it was quite an unusual game, I remember. I was only really being tested to a degree. Uh, and, of course, Martin Peters came in not until the May, I mean, when you consider it's only two months before the World Cup final and contributed so much. So we were, you know, two latecomers. Did that all come as a big surprise to you, Jeff? Yes, yes, uh, totally. I think I was always felt that I could always be a successful player at West Ham when I was in the reserves and the, the youth team. I felt, well, I can do better than they're doing and I think I can play for West Ham. I'll be a success. When you're actually told you'll play for England, you never believe that. It'll happen. I think people talk about it today, you know, I think I should be playing or whatever. You never, ever dreamed we'd be picked for your country. And I'll never forget uh, Ron coming up and telling me. Her second cap came against Scotland. In the absence of Jimmy Greaves, he scored his first England goal in a 4-3 win. Martin Peters wasn't capped yet, and contrary to popular belief, Bobby Moore's presence was of no great advantage to Hurst. Bobby and I, although we played at West Ham, were never sort of that close socially. And Bobby was slightly older than me and achieved uh, his fame probably a little bit prior to me anyway. I was still an unknown player. In fact, I used to use his name when I used to try to get into restaurants, you know, in the early days when he was successful and I wasn't. I'm a friend of Bobby Moore's. The story's been told quite a lot. So at that, that stage it was difficult. I think that the, the difficulty of settling into an England side I found quite uh, hard at first. When you, you go there you don't know anybody, apart from Bobby, as I say, I wasn't close to. Martin came along a little later on. So I suppose later on when I, I just more or less established myself, 
uh, when Martin came anyway. So I don't think it was a great help. And I think the social side of, of being accepted into a group of players is as important probably as the playing side of it when you, when you join an international squad. In Denmark, on England's pre-World Cup tour, Hurst was disappointing. In the previous match in Norway, Jimmy Greaves had scored four goals. So when the World Cup started, Hurst was out. I didn't deserve to be playing, didn't deserve to start the World Cup competition because I'd had a poor game and, you know, could, competition being what it is, I mean, Roger Hunt and Jimmy Greaves weren't bad players, so I didn't really deserve to be playing in those uh, two front spots. I was hoping they would win it. I didn't really consider myself that I would be playing if they continued to win because, like any cup competition, well, look, while a side continues to win, it'll probably be the same, apart from injury or illness. So I was ready to take the opportunity immediately after um, Jimmy was injured. And there's a goal! Oh, goal! Right the Pass from Peter. If you say that uh, we might have played that ball and hit, hit that header two million times <laughs> in five years in practice, it was, uh, it's, it's like any, any sport. You practice and practice individually and collectively doing certain things. And Martin's great uh, understanding and, and with mine, uh, you knew that the ball could only go one spot and I'd be in that spot. But it's something we'd, we'd uh, practiced a, a million times before. So Hurst kept his place for the semi-final against Portugal and laid on the second goal for Bobby Charlton. I felt that at that stage it would have been very difficult for, for Alf to change the team. I knew in my heart of hearts that it, I would probably play, in fairness, because I think I'd done very well. And I think the balance then that Roger and I had showed over those couple of games was probably slightly better than the balance that uh, we that Jimmy and Roger had shown together as two players in the early rounds. So I felt I would have been very, very desperately disappointed, probably as Jimmy was, uh, more naturally as Jimmy was, had I been left out at that stage. Because I felt, as, I, as much as I'm realistic in knowing I shouldn't have played early on, I'm just as realistic to think that I should have played quite categorically in the final. I was one of the few people who believed we would win it for two basic reasons. One, it was in this country. And two, we did have a good side. Uh, and I believed it, and I spread the gospel, uh, if you like. And what I never, ever thought was that we, wouldn't, that we would win it without me being in the side, mm. that I wouldn't actually be on that field in the final. And it was a tremendous uh, blow to me. I do fully appreciate the position that Jimmy was in because he was a man that was probably, not was, is, is the greatest goal scorer. Um, in our football history, and he's the man is a genius in, go in scoring goals. He was a, a regular uh, goal scorer for England, and the pressure's on him. People think he should play, and there's a certain, it's hard to put an embarrassment if, if somebody should be doing something and he's not doing it in terms of him playing, and perhaps not embarrassment, so not, maybe not the right word, but perhaps Jimmy felt that everybody think he should be playing, thought he should be playing, and didn't. And uh, but I fully understand the position, how desperately he must have felt not to be picked for the team. The night before, we went to see those magnificent men in their flying machines. And I, I, I left my favourite cardigan aside. I forgot about it, you know. So I was a bit worried about that, you know, almonds and whatever. And the Saturday morning, I got up and went to Mass early at 7 o'clock and came back and got a bit more stick off barley. Trying to just fill the timing in the morning, really. And then little Ray and I said, come on, we'll go and buy a new shirt because we've got this due tonight. And we're going to see the wives for the first time for a, for a while, you're saying. I was always one for lying in bed in the morning, not really getting up for breakfast. Um, and Jeff, well, Jeff was a good sleeper as well. Um, so I think everyone used to you know, talk about us always lying in and things like that when we went abroad as well, you know, we were always last ones down. I was quite relaxed on the coach going. You know, I was quite happy that we didn't have a great big centre forward to, to handle again like Torres because little Ubi Zeeler isn't, isn't that big. Hell of a good header of the ball, but, but it, I, I could handle the quicker ones better than I could handle people that were bigger than me that took you away positions. You know, Len Shipman and all those people coming and wishing you all the best because it was obviously a big occasion. But I remember Dennis Fellows um, coming along and saying to, to Ray, Ray Wilson, because I was sat next to Ray, all the best, George. And I thought, George? Yeah, I mean, he's been playing here for about six or seven years. I think I was aware that we were doing better as a partnership at that, at that moment in time, and that's the only time that counts. So I was very confident after the two games that I was going out there and play well. Moore of England, Cohen, Ball, Banks, Wilson, 
Hurst, Charlton, Bobby Charlton, Peters, Styles, and Jackie Charlton bringing up the rear. Her Majesty arrives in the Royal Box. Next to the Queen with Sir Stanley Rouse, the President of the FIFA, behind her, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, behind Sir Stanley Rouse. This is the German side. Number five is Schultz, one of the greatest defenders in football today. Bobby Moore, captain of England. Usual exchange of banners. England team, They're unfamiliar dark shirts. Never been beaten in a football match by West Germany. There's Jackie Charlton, number five. Bobby Charlton is dropped. Many places is soft, but the 1966 World Cup final is underway. The ground is at its softest. The Goma to our left. Bobby Charlton pumped, and Hurst moving up, and so too Styles again. Charlton, Bobby Charlton, has come, and the goalkeeper's flat out injured. And ball gave away a free kick pushing to Popsky. All right. Obviously bang in the face. Probably saying to himself, well, I heard Mohamed Ali, Cassius Clay was here, but I didn't think he was on the field. And up comes Peters. Here's Peters. Great save by Tchaikovsky. The way things are going at the moment, but the team's still doing a lot of sparring. And Wilson penalised. Taking Zayla's ankles. to Zeller. Schnellinger now to Helt, number 10. Who was the battle? To Halla, a goal! West Germany has scored! 12 minutes gone, Helmut Halla has put West Germany in the lead. German supporters making all the noise at the moment. Bobby Charlton. Now, Moore moving up to the attack. And brought down by Overath. Moore with a free kick. In goes! It's an equalizer! Last Saturday, Jeff Hurst got that vital goal which knocked out Argentina. Now he's got a vital goal which has put England back into this game. 18 minutes gone, it's one goal each. This is Emmerich, there's Beckenbauer approaching him. This is Helt. Emmerich going into the middle. What Sailor? I think it's interesting to note this Zayla, number nine there, Ken. He times his jump so perfectly, he goes up a fraction sooner than the defending players like Tommy Lawton used to. And it means he's up in position before the defending players can get off the floor, which makes it impossible for them to get at the ball. Twenty minutes from half time, one goal each, and a foul by Hutgaz on the first. Another good quick free kick. Styles out of the ball. Charlton and nearly swerved away from Tchaikovsky there's Bobby Charlton a lot of England's hopes rest on him this afternoon Beckham bar so far we've seen no danger from him bursting through Henry the sailor again 
Beckham Barr spent all his time following Charlton, a more a defensive player than he normally is. And out goes Hurst. And there's ball. That was the hard shot along the floor that I was mentioning to you about the ball skidding off. He didn't, he never really controlled that ball. He should have done, but uh, he is suspect for these balls. Now then, up comes Moore. At the sailor back in defence. Now England could well have this German defence a bit jittery. Seeing the goalkeeper starting to misfield the ball. Brilliant tackle. Good ball. And England are rather lucky to get away with only a corner against them. Corner going to be taken by Helt. is held now to Zeller Emmerich in the medal this is the German captain that was dipping under the bar another good save by Banks there's Martin Peters the man who scored the goal which could well win the World Cup for England all smiles in the Royal Box. Ball. To Hurst. Up comes Charlton on Hurst's left. There's Jeff Hurst. Well, he missed the target, but nevertheless, the ball went up onto the Greyhound track and the England supporters then know that they can see how near England were to the World Championship. But now they have another... 30 minutes. There's Bobby Charlton. Picture of a serious man. Off we go. 15 minutes each way. Styles has got stockings rolled down. There he is right in the centre of the picture. Ball has got stockings rolled down. This is always a sign. Crap creeping into the consideration. In comes Halla. Number eight, Helmut Halla. Now to ball. As they're going to have to pace themselves in this extra time. Is that beauty? That's the best shot Alan Ball's put in since he's been an England player. And it was a pretty good save by Tukowski. Ball. Jack Charlton. Peters. Bobby Charlton. Ball! Hit the post. And it, the goalkeeper's taken another one in the mouth. Red shirt or white shirt. And there's Peltz. Must be saying to himself, well, I do it all, laid on a plate, and there's no one there just to flick it in. There's Ball running himself back. And now Hurst can do it. He has done, yes! Yes! No! No linesman says no. The linesman says no. It's a goal! It's a goal! Oh, and the Germans go mad at the referee. This line, uh, at the linesman who can only speak Russian and Turkish. Well, it's a great old day for West Ham United in England's colours. 
So, England are in the lead again. 3 2. again with Hurst there's Jeff Hurst too willing to have a go and now to Buckenbar to Emmerich this is Held well Held has worked so hard for Germany today crowd buzzing, arguing, wondering how Germany going to pull it out of the bank again as they did in normal time. More. To hunt 21. Take off, that was buzzing not very far away. 21, love your hunt. One minute. 20 seconds left for play. Here's Schultz. Schnellinger is looking as if he can't move another inch. Does Haller is Sailor? Back to Schultz. Sends it along from Conan. This should be the last guess. One minute to go. Everyone's got to come up for this one for Germany. The referee looks at his watch. Any second now, it will all be over. 30 seconds by our watch and the Germans are going down and they can hardly get up. It's all over, I think. No, it's... And here comes Hurst. He's got some people around the pitch. They think it's all over. It is now. It's four. It is all over England of the world champions. England are the world champions. The crowd are on the pitch now, but who cares? At this great moment in English sporting history as Bobby Moore goes up to get the World Cup. Al Franzi walking forward to shake his hand. There is our friends, and the first sign of emotion from this man who has organized this picture. There it is, all the fuss has been about. And Bobby Moore comes up to receive the Jules Rimet trophy for England. A madness to the Queen. It's only 12 inches high, solid gold, and it means England are the world champions. I can remember seeing, you know, seeing Jack drop on his knees. I can see, you know, Nobby and another couple of players, you know, jumping for joy and hugging one another. And um, yeah, it was a marvellous moment for all of us. Nobby Styles jumped on me. Absolutely delirious he was, you know. Um, I was, I don't know if he found the energy, but he jumped on me, I, he knocked me on, on the floor, you see, and, and um, I can only describe it as sort of copulation, <laughs> right in front of a queen, in, in the middle of the pitch, you know, would have gone down in Rome's day. I mean, I know Big Jack Charlton just, just sort of uh, collapsed on, on the heat and, and, and sort of started crying. I, I, I know for a fact, it, 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 I mean, my feelings were, were uh, a sense of... Uh, just a right load of responsibilities completely off his shoulders. I remember Bobby Charlton crying, and I remember going around with the with the cup and uh, Alan Ball jumping on Big Jack's back. You know, I remember all that. And then afterwards in the dressing room, it was just pandemonium. I don't remember a great lot in the dressing room, but some of the Germans came in to swap shirts, and and uh, after that, really, I don't I don't really remember the journey to the to the um, reception. I want to be with my family. My wife now was my girlfriend then. I wanted to be with her. We've been away from home a long time. 
And being so young, uh, the fact that we'd become the best in the world didn't really get over to me. But in the dressing room, I can tell you, it was something that I couldn't quite understand, the, the reaction from all the people of Ray Wilson and Bobby Charlton, Jackie Charlton. Uh, they, they knew that they would never have a chance again of, of achieving something like that, and they'd done it. It certainly is uh, the celebration side of it. I can, I can vaguely uh, remember sitting in, in, the, in the banquet room, and uh, I really can't tell you I was, I was sat at the table with. It, it just went by, uh, by so quickly. I can remember having breakfast in the hotel the next morning with Jimmy Armfield and his wife, and, and, and my wife, but uh, we'd been out all night, obviously. The overwhelming feeling was being probably the loneliest man in Wembley Stadium that particular day. I couldn't force myself to join the festivities because I'd built, in my own mind, I'd built myself up that I was going to be in the side and I was going to be one of the key people who was going to achieve this, what most people considered to be an impossibility anyway. And I was going to be one of these people to do it and suddenly it wasn't there, it had vanished. The other members of the squad paraded the trophy on the balcony of the Kensington Hotel where the FA staged their banquet. There were constant cries from the packed streets for Alf Ramsey. The mood was almost like VE Day. It was chaos in the hotel, um, afterwards in the Royal Garden Hotel. And um, what also stuck in my mind was it was the greatest night in this country's life, and my life particularly, and and uh, my wife wasn't invited, and they were stuck outside in the corridor waiting for us to come out of the banquet, which I found rather strange, <laughs> and she certainly did. <laughs> it would have been nice if all the girls had been there, but we weren't. I think the German wives, but I'm not sure, I think they went. We was just like uh, 11 girls out on a night out, really. The, the thing I remember is um, going out on, on the night to Danny Roos Club. We used to have a club in Hanover Square. I'd have arranged for four or five of us to go, me, Bawley, John Connelly, the Burnley a winger, um, Robbie Styles, and Martin. And Martin Peters, um, at the last minute after the celebrations at the hotel, decided, I phoned up to his room and said, are you coming down? He said, I'm not, I'm staying in. I mean, I, I'm amazed that he stayed in, and, him and his wife Cathy. And I'll never forget that to my dying day. It was a long day, it was a uh, very emotional day, very physical day with the extra time. Uh, I hadn't seen my wife for a number of weeks, and so uh, it was just, uh, the thing that I wanted to do. I didn't want to go out shouting and screaming and, and drinking and whatever. I wanted to be quiet. Uh, and that's the way it was, really. When everybody else calmed down and reflected, Bobby Moore's quick thinking at the free kick which brought Hurst's first goal was labelled vintage West Ham. But at the inquests afterwards, it was Hurst's second that had everybody arguing. That uh, one that uh, made it 3-2, that came down off the bar again, uh, you obviously had a close-up of that. I was there isn't a... We can't really tell on television, we can't still on still pictures or anything, whether it was over the line, but do you, you any doubt at all? I was about the only one that couldn't see it, because as I hit the shot, I turned and I didn't see any of it. I didn't see whether the keeper touched it under the bar or anything. Roger Hunt, who was um, very near me, said it was definitely in. There was no doubt about it at all. Jeff, we're standing on the very spot where you threw the whole football world into a controversy which has never been properly settled. How clearly do you remember the goal itself? Um... I don't remember the ball to Nobby, that's from Nobby to Borley, um, but I know Borley was going to cross it. He knew that I liked the ball in very, very early from wide positions, as I do at West Ham, and I knew immediately that he got there, he was going to cross it without having one or two more touches. And I was quite pleased. He, the ball, actually, I was in a bit early, and the ball came slightly behind me, and I had to more or less drag it from behind me into a position to get a shot in in one movement. Um, and I was quite pleased with that, technically. I hit it more or less on the half turn and fell over, so I didn't really see exactly where the ball immediately, where it had finished up. I always go on Roger Hunt's reaction. Uh, I saw him second, uh, just afterwards going in where I think he could have scored, um, being a great striker and making sure. Uh, he wheeled away immediately, and I just feel that that convinces me more than anything that um, it was a goal. Although I think you believe you know, what you want to believe, and I wanted to believe more than anything in my life, but of course that was a goal, and I still believe that today. People said to me, well, why don't you just go knock it in? But it wasn't just there to be knocked in. It's hit the inner, on the side of the bar, and I was coming in at that angle, and the ball finished up going over that way, and Weber, who was marking me, I don't know if, if anybody's seen the film, was, uh, you know, the film afterwards, after the actual hit in the bar, but it's nearly past the goal, the ball, when it bounces up again, mm. and he heads it behind the, uh, behind the goal. The ball comes from the side, 
and I uh, run into the front and I see the ball when he comes up and I took him uh, over the goal. I have seen the, the television uh, pictures and uh, we saw that, that the chalk uh, was uh, uh, fl flying up mm -hmm. and therefore we said it, it was not possible that the ball was uh, behind the line. You know, still people uh, you know, talking about, about this goal. I was very, very close to the situation because I played, you know, it was in our zone, in our penalty zone. And I saw, of course, I saw the ball, you know, bounce, bounce down from the crossbar down to the, to the line and hit the line. So my impression was, uh, was, of course, no goal because, you know, if the ball hit the line, so it is impossible, you know, the, the whole ball uh, can be behind the line. I think it was not a goal. When you played football so many times and you've seen balls hit the bar and come down, you know inst instinctively by just looking whether they've gone over or not. And, uh, and I went, oh, it's over, you know. I, I was staggered when the linesman's flag was up because I thought he was actually disallowing it, you know. That linesman, Tofik Bakramov, is now 65 and later became head of physical culture at a college in Baku on the Caspian Sea. There you are, you see? It's quite clear that the ball crossed the line, quite clear. To this day, I'm convinced that Mr. Dienst, the referee, also saw the incident very well. To be absolutely sure, he then came over and consulted me, and I pointed to the center circle to say that the England goal was good. My intuition told me that if I'd been standing directly in line with the goal, I would not have had such a view, whereas I was about seven or eight meters towards the halfway line, so I saw very clearly that the ball hit the crossbar and landed beyond the goal line. So the great debate lingers on. Fortunately, on the day, Hurst put the result beyond doubt and his name into the record books by scoring his third and England's fourth in the last seconds. There wasn't even time for Germany to kick off. It's always fascinated me, Jeff, that when the final was over and things had died down here at Wembley, you actually made this walk from the tunnel out to the edge of the pitch just to check that the score really was 4-2. Yes, it was a funny thing to do. Um, amidst the chaos in the dressing room, uh, I asked whether the goal had counted, and they said it had done. Uh, so I knew it had counted, but I, funny enough, came up here and had a good look up there just to make sure, and it, it, I think it said 4-2, and uh, it was a strange thing to do at the time, because it was confirmed in the dressing room, of course. What do you think was going through your mind? I don't know. I mean, why do you do these crazy things, you know, in the midst of all the chaos that's going on? When you look back 20 years ago, or even the next day, it's a stupid thing to do. Um, you know, funny. Mind you, it begs the question, which people have asked you for the last 20 years, what was it really like to score three goals in a World Cup final? Um, well, it's, it's lovely to live with today. But when you're, you're down there playing, and it sounds very blasé, but it's an honest opinion, you're doing something you, you, you've trained for, and it's your job uh, for the past five or six, seven years, in fact, you've done since you were a kid. And um, when you're down there, you're not aware of the momentous occasion. You're down there for two solid hours running around and the Germans kicking lumps out of you. And it's great for your family and your friends and the country as a whole who, who watched it. And they are totally aware of the magnitude of the occasion. But when you're down there for those two hours, you're just doing a job. Um, and it, doesn't, it hasn't dawned on me. It, it's only dawned on me in recent years, the, the enormity of the occasion. And uh, it's marvelous. It's, it's something that always lived with me. I mean, a great story, only a, two or three months ago, I, a, a tramp came up to me in, in Euston Station and said, um, are you Roger Hunt the golfer? I said, no, I'm not. He said, come on, mate, said, you're Roger Hunt the golfer. I said, I'm not. He went back to his pals in the corner. They were sleeping rough overnight in the, in the buffet. He came back, we got you now. He said, you're Jeff Hurst the golfer. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> My wife and family, they're laughing. Eventually, he came back and got it. He said, you're Jeff Hurst the footballer. I said, that's right. He said, uh, he said, when you scored those three goals in the World Cup in 66, I was at Pentonville and we smashed a sell-up. <laughs> in 1985, England and West Germany met again. The same players, the same colours, the same result. And Hurst, fittingly, obliged with another hat-trick. 
Funny story about your children. They weren't born at the time, but they came to the game at Leeds when we played the rematch uh, very recently. And they got 20,000 people there, and it was a super game. Nine of the Germans turned up. All our sides started. And it was strange. They, they suddenly realised the importance of it all. And they sat in the car afterwards. I mean, there's no man at 40 odd playing the you know, silly game. And um, slightly overweight. And they sat in the car on the way home and said they, they were proud of me. And it, it sort of registered back, you know, all those years. And they, they were be, begun to be aware of the achievement. Well, I'm not the kind to live in the past. The years run too short and the days too fast. The things you lean on are things that don't last. Well, it's just now and then my line gets cast into these time passages. to relive that magic match of 1966 at home, it's recently been released in its entire unedited glory by BBC Video. And football will be back here on BBC One on August the 10th with the charity shield match between Arsenal and Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs>